Good morning. This is Bill from Auto Europa Naples on a lovely Naples, Florida Tuesday. Uh, the, you know, fairly decent mornings are continuing. Uh, it was advertised that it was going to be 69 this morning, but it's not. So I've been uh, thwarted on that one. It actually feels a little bit warmer than yesterday, but you know, what the hell, it's still better than our humidity soaked summers. The Augusts and Julys, we're still doing all right. Uh, today I have this 2017 Maserati Gran Turismo Sport. Uh, this is a very good looking car. Uh, it's from a company, Maserati, that of course has an incredibly storied history going back over a hundred years. Uh, and you know, in many ways, Maserati got lucky. You know, I mean, there's many, many car companies that were started like Maserati that faded into nothingness, but Maserati didn't. Uh, you know, it's been around as long as, you know, quite a few other companies or longer than, you know, many companies that you're more familiar with and uh, has persevered despite the odds. Uh, it was started back in 1914 by a group of brothers, a very prolific mating, breeding Italian family, the Maseratis. The guy, uh, the father was a train engineer and uh, man, did he like going after the wife. They made like six, I can't, it's hard to tell, there's either six or seven brothers, but only three of them. Uh, got together to begin Maserati, and that was Alfieri, Ettore, and Ernesto. Uh, those three guys started it in 1914. Uh, they essentially were building spark plugs for airplane engines. I mean, the war started immediately after they, you know, opened the company, so uh, they got drafted into that. Uh, they make spark plugs all the way through the war, and afterwards they just start building race cars, which was their passion. And they built race cars all the way through uh, World War II, and that was it. There were no production cars. I mean, maybe a few weird things got, you know, driven on the street, but their primary focus was race cars, starting in 1926 uh, with uh, uh, whatever the hell it was, the uh, Tipo something, Typo. <laughs> They made a typo, uh, the A6500, uh, and uh, they never looked back. And they had an incredibly storied racing legacy, uh, you know, with some of the best drivers of the time driving Maserati, some of the best uh, people in racing. And uh, they made it uh, all the way to the war. Then they had to go back to building spark plugs again and uh, electric vehicles, which I'm sure had sketchy reliability, but they did. And then after the war, they said, what the hell, you know, we're going to keep racing, which they did, but they're going to start building these sort of grand touring cars and sports cars. And over time, that became the prime focus of the Maserati company. Uh, you know, it changed hands more than a, you know, roadie for Motley Crue. I mean, it, you know, it was uh, started by the brothers, then it was sold to uh, a guy named uh, Orsi, uh, you know, an Italian um, industrialist. He moved it from Bologna to Modena. Uh, the whole company. Uh, the Trident, by the way, before I get on to that, that uh, rather beautiful symbol, that was designed and put on the cars by another brother who really didn't have anything to do with the company other than he was a little bit artsy, and I'm making air quotes there. Uh, and he took the Trident from the uh, a very famous fountain in Bologna uh, you know, from, uh, you know, what a Neptune, and put it on the front of the cars, and that's been on there ever since. Anyway, so Orsi bought it, he carried it through uh, World War II, and, uh, you know, then they started making these GT cars. Uh, the first one of those was the, um, uh, the Typo 60 Birdcage, a car which, this car, this Gran Turismo, sort of harkens to in the styling. It was called a Birdcage because of the tubular chassis that it used, and it was a beautiful, beautiful car, really gorgeous. Uh, then they made their most popular, probably, car up to that point, the 3500 GT. Uh, which was absolutely lovely to look at. And then the God Emperor of Persia uh, decided that he loved the 3500 GT, uh, but it wasn't fast enough. So they stuck a racing engine and it redesigned it a little bit and called it the 5000 GT and sold only about 33 of them to a very exclusive clientele. Uh, you know, they continued making stuff. They made their first Quattroporte, uh, that's four door, uh, back in uh, like 63. Um, and then they, you know, continued on. And in the late 60s, they ran into financial difficulties and they were bought by Citroen, uh, which made a car called the SM uh, by, Ma, you know, Citroen Maserati. A very neat car, very collectible today. 
but it didn't really work out. And then the oil crisis came along, they ran into more problems, they went into receivership. Uh, they were purchased by a guy named Alejandro de Tomaso. You might remember the de Tomaso Pantera. Uh, he was a, uh, I want to say an Argentinian industrialist. He kept the company for a little while. Uh, he ended up uh, teaming up with, uh, who the hell did he? Oh my God, you could just go on and on with their weird history. But anyway, into the 80s, they built the Biturbo. Uh, that was kind of an interesting car. They sold a bunch of them, but it was really crap. No, no offense to Biturbo owners out there. Then Chrysler got interested, and they teamed up with Maserati. They didn't buy it completely. They just bought a stake in it, and they made the Chrysler TC by Maserati, which was kind of a sleek LeBaron, and everybody hated it, absolutely hated it. And this, you could probably call that the low point for Maserati. They were kind of screwed at that point. Anyway, in the early 90s, Fiat came along, they bought them, and they figured, you know, we're going to take this name and do something with it, and they did. Uh, you know, in 98, uh, the first uh, Spider came out, uh, it, it got some success, they came back to the United States, then they made the Gran Turismo, then they made the Quattroport, they briefly sold Maserati to another company they owned, Ferrari, which was must have been devastating for Maserati guys, because that was their arch rival since like 1926. Uh, and they let, uh, you know, Ferrari hang out with Maserati for a while. Ferrari made it their luxury line, so to speak. And then they yanked it away from Ferrari and gave it to Alfa Romeo, where it still sits today. So, I mean, this thing has just, I mean, it, uh, Maserati has gone through a lot of different incarnations with a lot of different people, uh, partially because of their name, which is great, partially because of their incredibly storied racing legacy. You know, guys like uh, Juan Fangio drove Maserati's to victory in the uh, Formula one world champion. In fact, Maserati's the only Italian manufacturer to have won the uh, Indianapolis 500. They did that not once, but twice. The only one, so that's quite a claim to fame. So with all that, the name has a lot of value, and people have been exploiting that for years. But I think Maserati has finally found its uh, niche with Fiat, and that's building, uh, you know, pretty nice, pretty modern cars that, uh, you know, are semi-reliable and look beautiful and uh, deliver eh, sort of an alternative, I mean, if not a better car than the Germans or the other Italians make, uh, certainly an alternative that will let you stand apart. And that is what this uh, 2017 uh, uh, Gran Turismo is all about, the sport version. Uh, you can see the lines of the car are absolutely stunning. It's a big car. It's a big sucker. Uh, it's based on the Quattroporte platform. Uh, Quattroporte, of course, meaning four-door. Uh, which is just absolutely hilarious. I have this, it's not really a theory, it's kind of known. Everything sounds good in Italian, and I put that to the test. Let me pull my phone out here for a minute. I did this this morning just to check, and I wanted to make sure that I was right and that everything sounds good in Italian. And here we go. So I put in to Google Translate, I can smell the camel poop. And that translated into, oh Lord, let me get this up. Sento l'odore della cacca de cabello. And, and there it is. So, I mean, there is almost nothing you can't say in Italian that doesn't sound sexy, even if you're sniffing camel poop. But anyway, this one, it's finished in white outside. They're going to call it something crazy, like Blanca El Dorado. Uh, the inside is uh, finished in a lovely red, which is, you know, Rosso Corrado or something to that effect. Uh, all the lovely Italian nomenclature. Uh, you can see the giant grill up front, big air intake with that trident in the middle that's going back years and decades. Uh, very beautifully styled front bumper, long hood with muscular fenders. Beautiful, beautiful. Uh, the very classic Maserati portholes in the fenders. You can see the Pininfarina badge on the bottom. Uh, Pininfarina and Maserati go back many, many years. <clears throat> the first, uh, in fact, uh, Maserati uh, road car was designed by Pininfarina. Uh, going back into the lovely roof line, the little ducktail spoiler built into the trunk. It's got giant uh, piston, uh, you know, like six piston calipers up front with vented discs, 20 inch wheels in black. Of course, the sport model, you get a little bit more sporty stuff. Uh, one could say it probably has 
one of the finest sounding exhausts in the industry. We'll get into that in a moment. And of course that uh, beautiful Maserati name at the back. So anyway, let's just get into this car. There's a little pressure pad under there that I press open up. And here is the trunk, which is a little bit shallow, a little bit, you know, not for going to Costco, but is enough to get a set of golf clubs in there, which is probably all you need. Uh, this is the tool kit that comes with it. You get a little area down here for your tire inflator. There's the front license plate bracket that was never installed. Nice place to put a machine gun in there, maybe an MP5 or something. Fit in there with no problem. A few hand grenades, whatever. Uh, all very lovely and proper in the trunk. Let's go under the hood. Okay, so the mating with Ferrari went a long way towards how the hell is beeping in this thing? It's angry. Oh, for the love of God. For the love of God. All right, obviously it's very unhappy with me. I don't know what the hell I pressed, but that was obnoxious. <clears throat> All right, anyway, under the hood, 4.7 liter, uh, you know, light alloy V8, uh, pretty much a detuned Ferrari engine, but, you know, not that detuned. Putting out about 460 horsepower really moves this thing down the road. Uh, that's made it to a, a shiftable sport uh, ZF transmission, an automatic with a torque converter, uh, which, you know, again, isn't really like the dual clutch automatics in the Porsches of the Ferraris, but it's going to be more luxurious, which is what Maserati is going for. Uh, they're not trying to build track cars. They're trying to build, you know, really high-end, uh, you know, something James Bond would drive. It's sporty enough, but it's still pretty luxurious, and it's not going to jar your spine. And this engine, transmission, the skyhook suspension, all that stuff fits in there very nicely. Uh, you can see there's giant plastic overlays over this thing to make sure everything's hidden from view, and it just becomes this pretty, you know, red valve-covered engine. Test Testarossa. Well, it doesn't have red heads, but it has red valve covers uh, under the hood that just looks absolutely lovely. So, uh, beautiful engine from Maserati as per usual. Let's hop in this thing. Good looking wheels in this thing. I'm usually not a fan of black wheels, but they do work on this car with the red calipers. Okay, inside, Maserati really upped its game by the time 2017 came along. They got the message on fit, finish, quality, that sort of thing. You know, it was never bad. They always used nice leathers, nice materials, but uh, they didn't wear well. They just seemed to wear out very quickly, and, uh, you know, Chrysler and Fiat, they got together to really help with that. So these seats, they're going to wear a lot nicer than the prior Maseratis. The leather they use just looks good with age, even, as you get in and out of it. Uh, beautiful supportive sports seats. This one has the optional tridents in the headrests. Uh, if I lean this forward, you can see in the back, you actually have pretty decent room for a, uh, you know, uh, two-door coupe GT. Uh, you know, the Canadians you stuff back there, they're not going to be giggling with happiness, but they're going to be okay. Certainly on a short around town trip, there's going to be no problem with that. On the rear package self, you can see all the speakers this thing has, you know, big uh, you know, set up for, I don't know, it's Harman Kardon, Bose, I think it's Bose. It's got like 12 speakers and it sounds great, obviously, as it should. Uh, get a little cup holder set up there, a little place to put some sort of uh, Beretta in the uh, spot before the cup holder. So uh, your rear seat passengers are going to be on point and pretty chipper. I like the way the seat sort of rotates up and back automatically when you lift up the rear uh, backrest. Uh, door panel, nice, tight, proper, like the piano black, mates well with the sport package. Uh, you know, very, very simple. Here's a little spot for an axe handle or something if you want to use that to beat someone to death, which, uh, you know, obviously on the streets of Italy might happen. I don't know what it is about, um, about the Italians, but, you know, they just... The driving, everyone parks in Italy like they just spilled a beaker of hydrochloric acid in their laps. I mean, it is just absolutely chaotic. Uh, you know, you're going to be able to uh, park this car a lot better here in the United States. So, anyway, let's hop in. What do we have there? And the seat controls, nice. Okay, so now Sport is off when I start it, but I'm going to leave the door open. It's going to beep at me and all that, but you got to hear this exhaust. Listen to this. I mean, that is just absolutely 
lovely. I mean, the break-in attempt detected. That's why I was not trying to break in. I have the damn key. For the love of God. Uh, anyway, everything cycles very nicely. And break and detect. Well, let's restart it so that stupid message goes away. Break and attempt detected. All right, there. The message is gone. All right. Weirdly, on these cars, the check engine light cycles for a long time. It always tricks me into thinking it's just on. But it's going to go off here in a second. I'll wait for it. It's going. I have no doubt it's going to go off at any second. There it is. Long check engine light cycle on this car. Uh, beautiful sporty steering wheel. Nice big grippies at the 10 of 2. Just a hint of a flat top and flat bottom. Incredibly beautiful leather. Now over here is a sport button. Listen when I hit that. You'll be able to hear it. Okay, so that is going to open up the exhaust to make it more free-flowing, give you more horsepower, adjust the Skyhook suspension, uh, which, um, oh God, that's kind of a very high-end suspension setup. It, it's hard to explain in a nutshell, but what it does is it sort of senses the plane of the road and tries to keep the car on the plane by dipping the tires up and down as it goes along to give you the best ride possible. And uh, it's, uh, you know, a very high-end suspension that you find on a lot of uh, Bentleys, Rolls, that sort of thing. It's obviously expensive to install, and, uh, you know, you're only going to find it on cars with a sticker price of, you know, 140 grand like this one. Anyway, so now we are in sport mode. I can also turn off traction control here by pressing that. Now you see that's off. If I want to go do donuts, I can, I can do them. And uh, we're ready to do some serious driving. Let me turn that back on just for the warning light. You have beautiful leather wrapped surfaces everywhere. Lovely fit and finish. Uh, this is a version of Chrysler's Uconnect, which is a good thing because Maserati electronics used to be really crap. Uh, you know, they're still not great, but they're better than they used to be. Uh, so this is pretty good. It's easy to pair your phone to. It's easy to get around Bluetooth that sort of thing uh, You've got the standard analog clock that you're gonna find in any luxury car better have one of those or you're not a luxury car uh, You got all the multi-function stuff on the steering wheel for your radio and your uh, voice command Which I'm not gonna try the hell with it. It never works for me. You got a nice row of buttons over here your you know gas door you can change the mode on your driver information center to display stuff. You got your cruise control, your fog lamp for the rear. Uh, you got all these, again, the buttons here for your ice setting, your, if you want to turn off your parking sensors. You've got uh, direct stuff for the uh, Uconnect system, your CD, your radio. Nice little dual side climate control there. Uh, you know, very elegant and simple. Uh, shift lever, you know, for that uh, for that ZF transmission, electric parking brake, cup holders, you know, everything you need. And here you've got what looks like more cup holders. I don't know why, and uh, more than enough room to fit a big 357, maybe a Colt Python or something. Uh, the glove box I can't reach. Oh my God! But in there you're going to find stuff, including your auxiliary input, iPod. You got your Gran Turismo sports script on the dash, all very lovely. Uh, we've got all the books and window stickers with this car. Let me pull this out for a minute. Uh, there it is. You see 142 grand on the sticker, so the thing wasn't cheap. Uh, and there, a Rosso Corallo. There it is, not Corrado. That was uh, the guy from the Sopranos. Anyway, uh, very, very nice and uh, quite well equipped vehicle. Lovely. Have a look at that online if you want to see the sticker and all the manuals and whatnot. Uh, up here you've got a self-dimming mirror and uh, some more rows of buttons and stuff. If I had my glasses, I'd tell you what they were, but I can't see it. You also have a home link here for your garage doors. <clears throat> Let's go for a spin. Look at that. You have a genuine metal ashtray. You're going to want to smoke capris or something with that. I mean, that is the tiniest ashtray I've ever seen, but uh, it would definitely get you by. And because I'm filming, I'm going to leave it in drive. I'm not going to get into the manual mode. That's the backup sensors beeping at me in anger. Everything always beeps at me in anger in these cars. Even the Italian cars, you think they'd be more forgiving than the German ones. So quite sporty feeling from the, uh, from the transmission. Of course, we are still in sport mode, I believe. So we're going to get a little bit of that. Oh, God, the sound. The sound. Oh, 
there is nothing more lovely than the sound of a Maserati. Now, you know, there's going to be a lot of people who say, okay, you know, the 911 GT3 is not dissimilar money, and it's going to be a much faster car, much tighter on the track. Okay, fine. Uh, they're going to point out that, you know, other cars can do more for less, and that's all true. But that's not the point of this car. Oh, God. Listen to that. The point of this car is to elegantly go through your midlife crisis, you know, while not being in a Corvette. Uh, you know, I mean, you're, you know, the neighbors aren't gonna, you know, smirk when you're driving by. Yeah, maybe some of them, but they're assholes. Uh, you know, th this is a very lovely way to sow your wild oats uh, after you've made it a little bit in life at age 50, uh, you know, and elegantly show up to the nightclub or the strip club or, you know, the Asian masseuse or wherever it is you hang out and, uh, you know, do so with an incredible amount of elegance and style. You know, it's like, um, um, I don't know how to describe it. If you mated Ferrari and Jaguar, you know, you would come up with uh, with a Maserati. And that is what is so beautiful about their Grand Touring cars. Listen to it. Oh, my God. Oh, what a sweetheart. What an absolute sweetheart. What a joy to drive. Uh, anyway, there it is. 2017 Maserati Gran Turismo Sport Coupe. Big car based on that Quattroporte platform. So plenty of room inside. Super comfortable seats. You know, luxurious feel and materials everywhere. Just absolutely lovely vehicle to, uh, to go down the road in and, you know, feel good about. So uh, anyway, if you have an interest in this thing, give us a call, 239-298-8000, on the web at aenaples.com. Uh, a quick note, I've, I've figured out a name for the, uh, the this channel that's going to become the review channel. Uh, the for sale cars are going to be at Auto Europa. I got to figure, I mean, I'm an old guy, you know, I need like an 11 year old to set all this crap up for me and I don't have any handy. Uh, when you don't have kids, then, you know, you don't have anyone to work your crap for you, but I'll borrow someone else's kids and make it happen in the near future. And uh, when I do, we'll, you know, make a point so you know where to go. Uh, thank you very much for having a look. We appreciate it. And I'll see you with the next one. Take care.